on singing with me I wanna rock with the dudes to fear is no excuse so Baby, tell me what you say I wanna Okay, I still think I'm that badass bitch But cat, of course, when you get older You're always that badass bitch Or, or what did dudes say? Like, I'm still this badass bastard <laughs> anyway guys hi welcome to five minute mondays paving the way podcast with your host with the most bitches medusa m-a-d-u-s-a made in the usa and not milan italy yeah fucking wikipedia anyway so welcome to this podcast it is a part two dos uno dos itchy me eins vai I'll probably have to learn how to count in other languages as well. But anyway, this is part two to the Greg Oliver awesome interview. I hope you enjoyed the first one. Um, absolutely amazing. He he was like jovial this time. And if you know Greg Oliver, he's a little set back and laid back and dry humored, but a very awesome guy. I love him. He's going to be a friend for life. Um, I hope you enjoy part two. Um, it gets pretty good and deep, and he actually laughs and smiles more. So here it is. Get ready. Part two. Medusa is in action. All right. I got a couple questions, too, while we're going off on this. I'm talking about books and biography and venturing off. When you meet somebody... Um, or everything so far, let's just back up everything so far. Like, let's say there's writers out there listening and they're like, how do they get their next gig? Yours now is really starting to take off. And it's, would you have to say that it has to do with word of mouth and becoming more popular, getting bigger names, da, 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 da. How does that work? Well, it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, right? Life is really about connections, right? It's about, yeah. who you know. And yeah, it's going to look amazing that I've been on the Canadian bestseller list now for, you know, a month and a half with the book I did with John Gibbons, the, the baseball manager. So that's that's something nobody can ever, ever take away from me. I'd been on there once before with Don't Call Me Goon, but it was a single week. And it's a whole different thing being on there for for weeks and weeks, weeks and weeks. Yeah. And the nice thing with that, and, and this is something we've talked about, Deb, was that you know, Amazon's great. It's so awesome to be on there and see your, we were number one in the motorsports, you know, biographies yeah. kind of things like, again, but it was so quick, like a week or two. That was it. Yeah. It's awesome. But yet we don't know the metrics of Amazon at all. Yeah. Right. That's proprietary information. So that meant we could have sold two books that week <laughs> and there's no hey, other don't ruin it. Possible. Don't ruin the bubble. Yeah. Come well, that's on. not what happened. Obviously they, they, you know, we sold a lot, but that that makes it very different than when you're working with you know Canadian national bestsellers where there's a, yes. an established way that they've done it. Same in the U.S. Um, so yeah, the ego works for sure in in <laughs> writing too. You need to have that confidence. If you confidence. were drinking violent, violet, I don't think you'd be very good at doing biographies or autobiographies because you need to be able to talk to people. You could be a great fiction writer. You could be a wonderful writer and have zero social skills too. But doing oh, what and I that's do, the truth. I you know, think you, you do need to be able to deal with people. Yeah, I, I think. Yes, you do. And I, I, I love that we have different personalities because we got along so well. And your humor is so dry. It, it, it's dry, but so good. And I just. It was so good. So good, everybody. I, I'm just I want to go somewhere else with that. But first, I want to ask you this question because it kind of goes hand in hand with your writing. So have you ever thought about, um, now maybe you have, have you written like, I don't know how this works, like a book per se from a biography that has actually gone to a documentary movie? There's one in process that, so the rights to the Joe Graton story have been sold. <gasps> um, oh. But I mean, that doesn't mean that that could be held up for years, right? Years, so no, yeah. it just means they bought the rights to the book to make something happen. And, you know, Hollywood or, you know, uh, Hollywood North, as they call, you know, <laughs> Toronto, um, you know, th things can take forever, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet sometimes a project gets greenlit and off you go. I did work with 
the Megan brothers and, and a director named Harv Glazer and a great producer named Jeremy Shell on the Sweet Daddy Seeky documentary. And I was the writer for that. And then I sat in and basically was the one doing most of the interviews because I knew all the wrestling stuff. I mean, Harv was the director. He had this vision, what he wanted. And he did all the editing, this and that. But I was there so much along the way that it, in many ways it prepared me for working with people like you and John Gibbons uh, and Arezzi in the sense that you spend so much time with somebody that you know them intimately and you know what you can't put in there. And I mm -hmm. definitely asked, you know, Seeky all kinds of stuff that didn't end up in there. Um, but, but Did I guess- Did you understand? Did you understand when people tell you, I'm telling you this story, but it cannot go in. And I know as a writer, you see it once one way and we see it another. Is that difficult? It is. Um, yeah. So what did I tell you? I said, uh, you got to tell me everything. And then we walk stuff back. Right. Because it's far easier for me to write with stuff not in there um, than having big holes in, when, in the narrative because it didn't make any sense because I didn't know how to get from A to B to C when you didn't tell me about C. If I know about C and I need to avoid it, there's it's much smoother to do that. So you can say things and articulate in ways without saying it. Yeah, well, exactly. It's just there's a way to get there when you know what you're leaving out, I guess, is is the I hope that makes a little bit of sense. That... It does. It's difficult, though. It's got to be difficult for a writer if you know somebody that, you know, oh, my God, you know, this person slashed a tire, but you don't want them. To, you know, you don't want to say it type of thing. But how do you get around saying that it happened without telling it? I couldn't even imagine because there was a lot of holes in our stories, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, but, but it's also partly that journalism training, right? If I hadn't been gone to school and learned some ethics and things like that, it might be a very different book, right? I might have tried to push things through. Um, so that goes, in, that goes in hand in hand. Sorry to talk over you. Uh, no, that goes right. hand in hand. And did you write something about Benoit and his story and his family? Yeah, so right from the start when that happened, like I had known Chris. Uh, we had exchanged emails. He's Canadian, correct? Yeah, yeah. So he's yeah. from he's he's from was born in Montreal, but grew up in Edmonton. Yeah. And um, so I did one of his first lengthy real interviews uh, when he was in WCW, you know, where he went into all the Mexico stuff and working in Japan and working in Germany, like all the stuff he never talked about. And so we, we you know, basically made a connection and stayed in touch and, you know, send an email here and there. And I sent him an email when Eddie Guerrero died and got back you know, uh, you know, and there was a little bit of exchanges there with email and, you know, got back this long note about how his wife had bought him a diary to for him to share his thoughts and try to deal with all this loss. And it was really revealing. And then when he um, something broke in him and he killed his son and his wife and then himself, um, I had all that information. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. So God. it's like Great. the journalist in me kicks in the yeah. human being in me knows how awful it is and so there is a dividing line but it, it can be really hard and and you become but legally to... that's a thin line too no no he oh. shared it with me knowing full well who i am right it's not like i i hid who i was so no i, I there's nothing like that so anyways i ended up we did the book i i had a story on the front page of the atlanta constitution journal uh, about that stuff i did a piece in the globe and mail newspaper across canada uh, and then, yeah, so the, it was a quickie true crime book in the sense that there were four of us that threw the pieces together. I did one about um, Benoit. I did a piece on Nancy, who was yeah. woman uh, in um, WCW. We did a piece on the media treatment of the Benoit stuff. We did a piece on him being in Stampede. And then Irv Muchnick um, did a typical muckracking kind of thing that he likes to do and, and stir up trouble on uh, just everything. <laughs> And that's just who Herb is. And it, and it made for a nice, quick book. And what we found, though, is like here we are almost 20 years later. When I have those books for sale at shows, it's often young people buying the Benoit book, knowing they've heard a lot about this story. They don't know much. And then so they'll buy that book and, and to learn more. Yeah. Very educational, too. Um, wow. That had to be kind of. See, those are the situations I, I would feel as being a writer that, you know, if you really personally know somebody and then writing a story like that, um, how but, deep it can get. And how do you transition yourself as a writer to separate yourself without getting so emotionally attached? 
well, what we've done at Slam Wrestling is we've allowed ourselves to um, have a personal voice. We call it the Matt Matters editorial. So there are those chances to tell those personal stories, oh. right, about whatever may happen. Um, it doesn't have to be true journalism. It can be about your relationship with somebody. And, like, I can remember the one weekend Bob Leonard was the longtime photographer and promoter in, in Stampede. And Willie the Wolfman Farkas both died in the same weekend. And mm -hmm. I had tears for both of them because they were such great friends. Um, but yet still you have to write. And and I know it, it's as hard as the Willie the Wolfman piece was, I love his the piece I wrote about going <laughs> to the funeral even more because the funeral was in Hungarian. And here we are, all these <laughs> people that know from the wrestling business and we're what, what the hell's going on? What's what, what are they doing? Saying exactly, and then we're in the basement, and the lights go out. It's like, come on, Willie's playing a rib on us here. It's like, all those things. So, why wouldn't you want to write about that? It captures the spirit yeah. of it far better than just, uh, I guess, oh, words that's can do. awesome. Yeah, that's great way to put it. Um, I would love to, um, I know with books, a lot of people look for books, producers, writers, and stuff because there's so much content out there right now, and I know they're always looking at books, especially biographies, and they love to turn them into movies. But now more so into these series, they're like 10 episodes and, or maybe there's a season or two seasons. You know what I mean? To turn this book instead of just one movie cramping everything in there, because kind of like you ever see the movie Notebook? Now, that book was so much better than the right. movie but the movie was just moving right is i i feel that that is probably one of my favorite movies in the world because there wasn't anything blowing up there wasn't any you know this money flash it just it was a great well written story a book and i'm going to say this but whenever i think of that and since i met you you remind me of that kind of writing like it's just so genuine Okay, right. And you. I'm not just saying that because I know you, but I just, I think just the way how my book came out and I am going to preach this until the end is that I just, the number one compliment I get from your writing is that everyone feels that they feel that I am speaking to them. <laughs> uh, I'll tell the story. So oh, the, your book came out a week before Gibby's or two weeks before Gibby's. Mm -hmm. And so my dad has not, he's always been very supportive and loving and, and this and that, but I can't say he's read all the wrestling books, but he'll come to our wrestling event or things like that. Um, but I don't think he's read a book since I did one on a guy named Father Bauer, who was involved in the hockey business. And he was from Kitchen Waterloo, where we grew up. Anyway, so my dad proceeds to devour Gibby and then he reads yours and he goes, so Greg, how much of those books did you write? <laughs> and it's like, what? <laughs> but I, I, all of it? And he goes, but it sounds just like them. Well, that's the skill, Dad. That's, you know, that's taking all their stuff and making oh. it into something that makes sense, right? It's a little bit of a puzzle. But right? Yours I... especially was a really messed up puzzle, but making it flow, right? Like, it's but, easy but, to Greg, tell stories, but everybody tells so many stories. You got to sort of piece them in there. You and stepped then... out of your element, though, from what you're usually writing, because everyone has their own way of writing, right? But I think with my book and your and his is totally different from the other books. Oh well, then yours and then capturing a, a woman, uh, especially one as intense as you, was was a, an interesting challenge too. Um, all these things. Now, I guess I need to mention my wife. <laughs> uh, I need to mention my wife here briefly, though, because I mean, you've met her. She's a pretty. Oh, strong, Meredith is beautiful. She's oh my a god, strong I... woman too. Thank you. But um, she worked with Dewey Roberts in the Missing Link on his autobiography. That's right. You told me. And yes. so that was my first experience going through an autobiography and Dewey for all his flaws and he drove us nuts and he was addicted to pot and was unreliable. And, you know, he broken his nose so many times that he like <laughs> sniffed like all the time and all these things. And he drove Meredith nuts. She wanted to walk away so many times she saw it through and I admired that so much, but it also taught me a lot about what worked and what didn't about autobiographies. And I didn't realize that until I sat down to do my own. Right. To work with Joe Graton and then with Arezzi and then with you and, and with Gibby that I'd obviously taken away a lot from that um, and, and trying to pick subjects that were somewhat 
a little bit more stable than uh, than Gibby was. Or sorry, then then uh, wait, Dewey wait. Robinson was. Gibby yeah, was very right. stable. G Gibby was. Uh, I was super stable too. You were reliable for sure, Thank and that's you. part of it, right? It's like we set a date <laughs> and a time. You talk, yep. and you know, do you stay on topic? Um, generally, you were pretty good, but I got better at that, didn't I? Right? Like, isn't that? There's you would shift me because I would talk. I would speak about a certain subject, and then. You're, you're, I know you're, I, I knew you were not just a good person, but a good writer because you would, you'd be like, okay, come back, <laughs> come back yeah, to the main sub, yeah. get back here. And then I get back on track. But it's like, I had to say all of those things to get to point A, to get to point M, to go back to B, to get, but for it to make sense. And you wrote it just like that. I cannot stress that enough. Um, okay. So circle back here <laughs> and go back to what I was saying about biographies and movies, right? Okay, so have you ever written, have you ever been hired to write a documentary? I did the script for the Seeky documentary. Seeky, okay. And then now, is that documentary same as, which can be cut up, same as like to a series and a movie? I guess, I, I don't know. But the, the fact is with a documentary and writing a script, it doesn't often end up reflecting the final product. Right. You have to have a script and a plan to get approval for funding, which is what happened. And going back to the connections and how, you know, people, the Megan brothers who were producers on it basically went into the head of CBC, our national you know, TV uh, broadcasting channel. And they happened to know the guy because they'd done a bar mitzvah for his kid. Or a bat mitzvah, I don't remember which, but the fact is bat mitzvahs for a girl bar. Well, I know I can't remember if it was the boy or the girl oh, that okay. had the party, but their their specialty outside of doing this wrestling stuff was they ran parties. Um, and so they ran that that party for that guy. So he immediately took that script, put it at the top for him to look at, and that's how the money got greenlit. And that explained a lot about how life works, too. And yeah, and, you know, those things you don't know. So um, I'd like to get more into this movie stuff, but you yes. just don't know where life's going to take you. Right. And you need to, again, work I think it starts with the root of the book though, too, and the interest. Cause a lot of those right now, which is a really hot topic is books to series. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I, I've watched a series and I thought to myself, why couldn't this be a movie? So they get more money, more traction, more time, more views, out of a series and it's from one to 10, one to eight series, like they're 45 minute episodes, you know, to break down the, instead of, you know, just the movie part, um, I'm leading up to something. So I have been putting something together and I think you're going to be pretty amazed by this, but for a long time, and I don't even think I ever told you this when we were writing our, my book is that. <laughs> How many times have um, you heard that? Okay. Whatever. Is that for years I've been wanting to do a TEDx talk. And so I've been putting things together. I reached out to somebody, led me to someone else, had a Zoom call today to finalize a few things. And so I was wondering, Greg, here live, like, could you help write or have you ever, and this might be something new in your wheelhouse, yeah. Yeah, that maybe you can write a TEDx script for me. <laughs> So, and again, it's all about people, you know, my, my sister-in-law has had a TEDx up there that, you know, gotten like over a million views and she got some award from YouTube. I, I, I don't pretend to understand it all, but yeah, life's about challenges. You don't know what's going to be next and you don't know, you know, where. Well, that's a challenge for you to think about. Don't have to give me an answer today. I just thought since but... we work together, we probably could have something pretty compelling, so different. And TEDx works totally different. Once you do your research, you'll figure out what it is, but I thought maybe you could add that to your list. <laughs> it's a big list. It is. It is. Um, okay. So I, I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, I know there's a couple other questions I want to ask you, but Marsh, do you have anything for Mr. Greg? Uh, I had a quick question for you. There, When you look at their your list of books, it's primarily hockey and wrestling. Uh, and then you get to uh, Gibby, obviously baseball. You get John Arezzi, which is wrestling, country music, and baseball. Is there is that you venturing into a new avenue of stories you'd like to tell, or is that just what has come across? Like, is there a, a different series of of stories that you're looking to to go down? 
What is your uh, dream? Like, I think what you said earlier, Marsh, too, is like, what is your dream, dream writing? Story. Yeah. yeah. No, there's, there's a good point. Well, I mean, I like the challenge of, of with the Resi's book was learning about country music and learning more about baseball. And that paid off in the sense you go down the road and you learn more things. And we got to meet Deb and Gibby and and John's helped introduce me to some other interesting people. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, a dream well, in the wrestling world. I've said this often. I think CM Punk would be a great book because he's also got that hockey connection, right? He's a huge hockey fan, a big Hawks fan. So at least we'd bond on that level. Um, I don't think I've ever met Punk in all these years. I know I people interviewed him from my site, of course. <gasps> this year, CAC. And he's going to be at CAC. So yeah, let's put in a good word. Um, <laughs> and so that's kind of the dream. Th but I'd love to do a real music uh, biography or autobiography and actually, you know, somebody who's an artist and and you mean a musician yeah, type uh... yeah exactly like that that kind of idea right somebody really talking about the process the artistic process because i've learned so much about my own artistic process uh that something like that would be kind of neat um there's lots of books you turn down too right or ones that don't work out or you know people flake out on you and that's just the nature of the beast really i mean it's a big commitment to do a book and once they realize sometimes how much work it is or how much money it may take or, you know, whatever it may be, they just may walk away. And and sometimes they're just crazy, right? And you don't want to deal with them. Or unreliable. Or uh, Manny Fernandez. Have, did you ever meet Manny? Oh, you must Oh, have. my God, yes. So, oh, like, Mr. I, he, purple Man. He was always purple. He, he couldn't tell a, a truth if his life depended on it, right? And he asked me about writing his book. And it's like, Manny. well, um, no. <laughs> how, how can we do this? You know, it's like, um, you know, uh, yeah. So that, that kind of idea, it, it's easy to walk away from things. And I probably shouldn't have thrown his name out there, but I did. And that's one I said no to. Oh, well, that's all right. You said no to him. So yeah. sometimes you do. And I'm sure there's been others that, you know, I think I've dropped a few names. And you're like, I don't know, that's questionable, which we won't mention, you know, because they could be a husband or a wife of somebody. Is it really exciting or is it just, you know, stories they're dropping? You know what I mean? So it's just a, is it a, I don't know. Do you want to tell all or do you want someone? It's just that'd be a hard decision. I mean, because your reputation's on the line. Right. And that, that was the fundamental difference between you asked about the sports stuff, Marsh, is that, you know, when you're doing hockey, you can fact check everything. For Gibby, I, I could figure out what pitch in the inning he hit a ho his first home run, like right down to that exact moment uh, and what kind of pitch in some cases. Uh, whereas like with monster trucks, what we quickly yeah. learned is there was almost no documentation out there. It was Zero. ridiculous. It took forever to figure out where she even debuted. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, so you, you look at other people's lives that maybe aren't as documented and, and they're a different challenge in a whole different way. Right. So I often start out just by trying to create a timeline, right? When did this happen? You know, birth, <laughs> right. Right through to where we are at the end. It's like, well, sometimes they fudge when they were born i don't know deb you were you, did you ever correct that wikipedia entry so you're now oh my the proper age no it says i was born in milan italy yeah. okay well that's what for they sure. ran with from day one because of my last name michelli well, the story's in the book people it's on uh -huh. amazon <laughs> buy the book buy the book <laughs> buy the book buy the book buy all the books um marsh you got another question because i got something to ask you with you getting to the medusa story and a lot of these pro wrestling ones uh Medusa is really the first like wrestling autobiography. So that brings you new into that scene. Have you found that that scene of other authors who oftentimes work with the wrestlers to tell their story? Cause uh, there's kind of a small handful who seem to do it for whatever reason. Uh, how has it been kind of like joining that group or do you not see yourself continuing on that, that way? Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, you got guys like John Cosper and um, Kenny Cas Casanova and Ian Douglas and and some of these guys who have sort of created a little bit of a niche almost, right? That they're yeah. they're Greenberg. doing these they're they're smaller level ones, and I'm not knocking them because self publishing is, has come a long way from like we used to call it Vanity Press, right? In the 70s and 80s, when my dad was doing his uh, Buyer's Guide to Factor Outlets, really that was a Vanity Press project because he was paying for it. To publish it and then did all the distribution himself right and then taking out little classified ads and things like that. it's mm -hmm. it's crazy to think about now how easy it would be to do that but then you don't need a book like that anymore because there's the internet um 
so yeah, there's this little group of guys, but the thing is I knew most so many of them anyway, because I had run slam wrestling. Yeah. Right. So I had done reviews on them. We'd done interviews with them. There's so many guys that we helped along the way. So Jamie, Jamie Hemmings uh, and I went down the road to do a pro wrestling hall of fame, the women and ECW press just felt it really wasn't the right time, but we'd done a ton of interviews with all those old timers, whether it was, you know, Ella Waldick or Lucy Dupree, like these people who aren't around anymore. And so when Dan Murphy and Pat LaProd came up with the sisterhood of the squared circle, we helped them out. You know, these, these projects are just sitting here, right? We did all this work. So there is a, a bit of a brother sisterhood uh, of writers in the wrestling world. Um, but it's partly one I fostered, right? Because of what slam is and represents. I like to give, Authors love. Um, I do a volunteer column for the Society of International Hockey Research um, just on authors. So I talk to, you know, authors of hockey books, right? It may be somebody who self-published something. It may be, you know, multi-time Stanley Cup winning Sir Shavard, right? There's lots of people I talk to. Authors need love, I guess is the best way to put it. So thank you for having an author on and showing a little love. <laughs> yeah. it's funny you Aww. mentioned that book too that was given to me as a gift a couple years ago for christmas and i love it i've put it over a bunch of times i didn't realize you were involved in that well the sister of the squared circle yeah yeah, yeah well again i understand ego too right they're not going to go and it's like also you know all these files from but it was a big part of us uh sharing all that stuff and dan uh and pat are our dear friends uh even like yeah. the the projects that um steve verrier did right the gene kaniski book like I shared all my files, like he'd never met Gene, he'd never interviewed him, but he was a big fan, you know, and he did lots of stuff with Nick and Kelly, but I had actual oodles of interviews with Gene and, and would I use them again? He'd already died. I had Gene talking about his late wife. So he, nobody else had this kind of stuff. So I'd rather see it be used. Uh, and, and if I get credit, great. Uh, I don't think I've been paid in many cases for some of these things. <laughs> Uh, sounds like got, he has files and files like a resi does of all those 30 year old tape no, stuff i just need I to become a digital out. archivist for all of you guys i know <laughs> i know uh, that you have no idea that the sheer number of photos i have in this house um i, I inherited stuff from other people right and hopefully two, you're insured i have two banker boxes stuff of whipper watson's like, you know, old clippings and photos. I have one of his paintings. Like, you know, there's just stuff that, wow. yeah, you get stuff because people know you do. St it's the same way my dad's a big stamp collector. And when somebody dies, they'll just either give it to him or he'll buy it for a song. That was my yeah. next question. So what are you going to do with all this stuff? Like, will it, give it, museum it when you die? What, where does it all go? Well, I did so much stuff with Steve Johnson, right? We did the five pro wrestling hall of fame books well four of them we did together but there's five in the series and we worked on the benoit with uh, heath mccoy and irv muchnick but um steve and i have already sort of talked about that we generally do update each other's files every so often just yeah. to make sure that uh, the electronic files at least are, are at least shared right so somebody out there has a backup if something does happen so um my wife's not like she understands all that I do. So I think she would see that it goes to a right spot. She wouldn't just yeah. throw it all out. Um, but I don't know, maybe. <laughs> mm. I don't know. Because people like you and Arezzi have so, I mean, very valuable information, you know, and boy, it would be great to go to a somewhere museum. Somewhere to, to, somewhere. to tie it back in though, the, your stuff though, Deb, what was remarkable is you've been in wrestling and monster trucks for so long. You still have so much stuff despite moving a lot. But you always kept that one central spot. Like you were married a few times, all those kind of things. Read the book. But um, the wrestler, the male wrestlers often lost their stuff or had it thrown out by some vindictive wife. Yes. And, you know, all those things. So that's a very common story when you talk to the wrestlers. Um, the hockey players, it's not quite as bad. They generally were a little bit more stable. Um, so and kept their stuff. And yet I did two books on hockey documents. Right. Old contracts and paperwork and like things like where the general manager sends a letter to the player to show up at training camp, like stuff as fans, we never get to see. Right. But as I talk to these guys about these old documents, I would make sure they got a copy and send it to them again because they oh, so why cool. would they still have a contract from 1950? I they do. do. <laughs> well, you were around 1950. I know. Not I, yeah. 50, but I mean, yeah. I had my first 
my first remember my first WWF contract, my first yeah, WCW man. contract. Oh my god, yeah. Okay, all right. Um so for all the aspiring little students out there that want to be writers or journalists or whatever. So with today and social media, what are some great points that you can give? Not to fast track, because a lot of kids or I shouldn't say kids, people want it ready, fast, and now. But what is a good tactic that you can embrace on that would make you your own individual seeked out writer? In what aspect though? Like social media wise or writing wise, I guess. Just writing. Yeah. And being that individual where you can you're you know, okay, you well, have different levels of writing. You know, you you can write about this, 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 but a lot of it's research. But your style of writing has changed a little bit. But when one is first starting out, of course, of course, you want to learn about journalism, right? Maybe go to college. Maybe take a few writing tips. Maybe work for a paper. How, what do What do you think? Just what do you do? Well, you find your voice, but finding your voice comes with gaining experience which and then experience leads to confidence right and and that's a slow process in writing yeah. right like you're only getting better by reading other stuff that's probably the key <laughs> key thing it's like it's like if you're a, a filmmaker if you're not watching other people's films and seeing what they're doing how are you going to get better wrestling right. is great at that because wrestlers are always watching other people's matches right and picking up little things they can do it's the same in writing. It's like if you don't, if you want to be a sports writer and you don't know who Ring Lardner is, well, you're not doing this right. You know, you've got to go seek out some of those people. And I found a way to bridge all that in the sense that look, I mentioned my hockey book call, and I get to talk to other writers about their writing process. And and that goes to guys like Kenny Casanova and John Cosper and stuff. So I get to understand sort of where they're coming from, how they're getting there, and I can learn from that too. So you never stop learning in anything in life. And writing is certainly one of those cases where you can always keep improving and language changes. I yes. look at some phrasing that are in old articles oh. and it's like, oh, you can't do say that anymore. And that's not just cancel culture. It's also a more sensitive, more aware world. And that's OK. Um, yeah. And, and even just working on your book, Deb, there's so many things we have to figure out how to say it in a way that oh. was going to be proper. I guess, in a sense, right? Because like not every word was swearing. We had to careful to clean that up a little bit. But I, I said a few adult words. Yeah, exactly. My transcription program, <laughs> there would always be swear words in the top. You know, they usually gave me the top <laughs> 10 words that were used. There'd <laughs> often be swearing. So she's been really well behaved on this podcast, hasn't she? Um, Arsh, so. Ah, shit, hellfire, damn fuck. Okay. <laughs> well, hell. But well, yeah, read, okay. read, read. That's the, that's the key to anything. And I love my chances to read. So even fictional on or non-fictional? Um, well, I, I, <laughs> well, I was just on a little vacation, so I read a couple of fiction books, which I don't often get a chance to do. Uh -huh. um, on on who's your favorite writer in fiction? Um, I got a chance to interview Timothy Zahn. He was probably my favorite writer, sci-fi writer. Um, and I got to interview him, and I, that was one of the books I read uh, while we went out on a short vacation out to uh, Oregon, Portland. And then, you know, Meredith, we were at the, the big uh, Powell's books there and she picked up a local writer and then I read that book. So it, it's wow. always writing, but or it's always reading. But then I do have a small rule, which I'll share, is I don't take work to bed. So I'm not going to read a hockey book or I'm not going to read a book I'm editing or I'm not going to read a wrestling oh. book in bed. It's got to be something completely different. So if I have graphic novels that maybe I got mm. from the library or I bought, that's great bedtime reading or if it's a novel or if it's a music biography something like that those are okay because they're not my something wheelhouse. you're not working on exactly you need do to you read a couple it. books at a time oh yeah oh, God. i do too i got I think three. i have 20 books up there from the library because i turned off the <laughs> the alert thing when i was away and i came home and all these books are here so yeah i read three books at a time one on the road run by the bedside one in the toilet <laughs> the <laughs> best compliment i ever got uh, I think Steve was actually Steve Johnson was told this, but Bobby Heenan told us that he kept the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, the tag teams in his bathroom. So what? if your brain could do that, that's <laughs> is that not the brain. greatest compliment ever? See, I see. Okay, um, okay. Before you have another question or anything, Marsh, if you do, um, 
thank you again for your time. And if there's anything else you want to add, Greg, please feel um, that you can. Um, and another one thing I want to end with two things here is that writing a, bi a biography, I wanted to be different. And you were able to capture that in a way that I, I just, you know, no one else has ever read in wrestling history books. I just wanted to tell you that there's no book like mine out there, like any other wrestling books. Thank you. So and thank I'll, you. I'll absolutely agree with that. It, yeah. It, it's definitely unique and it's very much you. Um, it's me, but I think it's a technique. Greg is what I'm saying is, is that it, 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 it's a, it's a technique for wrestling. I think you're capture. I think you're capturing something is what I'm trying to say is because everyone loved it and, and it's told in their, their voice. So keep that in mind. That's a lot of feedback I get. God, if I wrote like that, that's how I want to write one, want my book to be written. <laughs> FYI. And also, um, as you experienced and he finally admitted sorta marsh is that i had so much content that one book is not enough and i when i first wrote my book i told michael at ecw press and greg first thing i said i said guys i want to write a trilogy on my biography and everyone you know just thought that was great except for mike and greg they said there's no way we'll just put it in one book i said guys there's just too much i, I how do you put 40 how do you put monster trucks and re and my personal life i know you guys heard this before so we're all about halfway, three quarters through my book, and Greg goes, there's too much here. We're going to need a book on each chapter. <laughs> so I, so Greg and I have got an idea and a plan, and um, it's going to spin the world upside down. Um, we're just going to keep going forward, and, you know, hopefully things keep cracking out there. So I love working with Greg, and our next, our next project with continuation of the book is going to be pretty awesome. And then, Greg, I wanted to say is you put me in contact with some great people. Thank you. Um, you know, sitting, talking to some women from Canada about their own uh, documentary and stuff that they were doing. I can't mm -hmm. think of her name. The dark hair. Yeah, Kate. Kate Kroll. Kate. Yes, Kate. Uh, uh, what a beautiful woman. Um, also, I have... Uh, I have a goal that I wanted to do. and You hooked me up with her. Again, I'm going to circle back from the beginning of this interview where Greg said that everything is about connections. And Greg connected me with this wonderful lady. Um, and I want to do the remake and put it together. And I'd love to work alongside with Greg. <clears throat> and of course, the lady. Um, I need to contact um, her again and continue forward. And that is the Lipstick and Dynamite. Oh, Ruth Lightman, yeah. And again, those are some of the fun moments that we talked about the women wrestlers having Penny Banner up here. So when my son was born, Penny Banner insisted on sending a present for Quinn. Oh. So like that's that's a wonderful and that's somebody we've only met a few times. Right. It's just yeah. you meet some wonderful people anywhere. But the wrestling business, um, for whatever reason, it's so self-serving and often backstabbing mm -hmm. that you, when you do meet the people like her that stand out, um, it, they really stand out. Yes. And I have a feeling you'll, you're will you just going to be a friend for life, Greg. So thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for teaching the people that you're teaching and having the, and giving people the motivation and inspiration to wanting to become writers. Thanks for being a pain in my ass this <laughs> whole time writing the book and a good pain in the ass. Um, you become a great family to my family, my husband and I, and um, yeah, thanks. Marsh, you got anything else? Oh no, I'm just. It was really cool to sit down and talk to him a little bit more, uh, a little more thoroughly, and hear the whole story because I only met him briefly at uh, CAC. But even then, I could tell the guy already had an, an amazing story to tell on his own. You know, and that was that was a crazy time too because I was working on the documentary, two documentaries at the same time as being at CAC. That was the craziest CAC ever. I think. Oh, you know, it's time. funny too. Now I think about it. That was the the weekend that I met Medusa, and so I remember even talking to him, being like, "I might do a podcast with her, maybe." And then fast forward a year, <laughs> here we are. Here yeah, we are. That, that was probably through Resi, wasn't it? So it's like it was absolutely you know, through Resi. Yeah, yeah. yeah Resi. Nope. What do I He's call him again? The connector. Call him the hub. The connector. The hub. The hub. The hub. The hub. No, yeah. his new name is the hub. Yeah. Yeah, and and yeah, definitely John has helped me a ton, and there'll be more things. Um, yeah, and and um, the one thing I didn't mention, which I probably should mention, is the my favorite book out of all my books, though, was the one I wrote with my son called Duck with a Puck. 
And, oh. you know, he was coming to these events with me to sell books and he'd be running around spending money on buying like an Atlanta Flames hockey puck at these hockey card shows instead of helping me at the table, which is fine. It was it was great fun. But so we wrote a book together called Duck with the Puck about his favorite stuffy playing hockey. And there's nothing that will ever compare to being on TV, like breakfast television with my son when he's, you know, talking about his book and all those memories that come out of that. And yet even that was part of the process, right? Like I wouldn't have done that if it wouldn't hadn't done all those things before. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, it's, it's just been a wonderful ride and uh, it's been so much fun to, you know, have a family shelf of bookshelves, right? Like, you know, there's my book, Quinn's book, my, my wife's book, my sister-in-law did a book, my father-in-law did a Jeez. book. And when, when my father-in-law died, we found a bunch of his poems. So my son mm -hmm. and I published Oof. a book of his poems um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff I've been involved with book wise, um, that doesn't necessarily have my name on it. Let's put it that way. I right. probably laid out 40 books. Um, yeah. And, and contributed to other books and yeah, it, it's been a wonderful ride. Where can people get a hold of you if they're interested in Good, talking yeah. to you? Always the plugs. That's the important thing, right? Yes. Um, Medusa.com. No, wait, no. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, wait. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Alloverbooks.ca is uh where all my book stuff is um and then uh slamwrestling.net uh is uh obviously our website we've been doing for a long time uh, most we'll put people that know on all the links yeah 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 exactly work the work the tech and um but yeah it's it's pretty great all my socials are off uh, the oliverbooks.ca site too and uh yeah it's been a pretty wild ride and I'm definitely enjoying it and uh there's always something next let's put it that way until book number two, three, four. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I appreciate you so much. It's been great um, spending a whole hour, an hour, what the hour and a half with you. What yeah. the? I feel like we're writing another book. Oh it's my a, god. It's a lot quieter than going out for dinner with you. Let's put it that way. So. <laughs> oh please. She showed hey. up and bought the margaritas like right away, Marsh. You should have seen it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Chips and margaritas. And we, none of us got in a fight, nor none of us were naked. So it was good. <laughs> it's a win-win. All right. Thank Call me you. Queen of Carnage. I will beat your ass. This is my time. Busting doors, breaking glass ceilings. And I like to play. They used to call me a Lunder Blade, but not anymore. I am Medusa and always will be Medusa. And that's what I think of the Women's Championship belt. Oh, hey.